Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Ask the Breeder. And as the breeder, I will try to answer as many questions as I can. Thank you for your overwhelming response to this series. Um, as you can see, Apple was again the first one to jump up into my lap, but Bootsy is not to be outdone, so she is up here too. Anyway, let's get to some questions here. Are you you want my reading glasses? Nah, you're the one who needs them. Okay. So, the first question was actually asked twice. I had a question from Brenda saying, uh, my dog has leaky eyes that smell yucky. Have we ever had a case of this? And what is there to do? And then a few days later, Melina from Sweden. Sweden, can you believe that? Hello to everybody there in Sweden. Anyway, um, uh, Melina says that her dog is wet between the eyes and uh, wants to know what this is due to. I am assuming that the wet between the eyes is pretty much the same thing as what was referred to as uh, yucky smelling stuff. Um, these are what we usually call tear stains. Tear stains are uh, very common in all breeds of dog actually. Uh, maybe a little bit more common in the short muzzled breeds of dogs like Cavaliers. Here's a picture of an extreme case of tear staining in a Cavalier. It shows up definitely a lot more in, especially in Blenheims, because the tear staining occurs on the white fur that's on their face. Um, there is a chemical called porophen, or porophens, I'm not really sure, but it's something that's caused by the dogs breaking down iron in their diet. And most canine diets do involve quite a bit of iron. And those porophens cause the staining. Um, there are various ways of dealing with it. The best thing to do is to work on hygiene. Cleanse the dog's eyes and the area around the eyes as much as you can. You can use a safe eye wash which you can either buy, uh, buy online or you can get from your veterinarian um, to wash that area around the eyes, especially around that white fur, especially below the eyes where the tear standing happens. Uh, there are also pads that you can buy online or in pet stores that uh, are used to just wipe down that area and that's an easy way to deal with it. But the more you keep them clean, the more you can deal with it. My second question comes from Anne, who wants to know, why do we see so many Blenheims in dog shows? Well, um, to predict the color that you're going to get from a particular breeding, it can be kind of a complex matter. Uh, I have a chart here that I sometimes consult. Uh, let me put a copy of it up on the screen so you can see it up close. It, it, it's kind of overwhelming when you see this. What it really boils down to is that you have to know that solid colors are dominant over the party colors, the, one that have, the ones that have white in them, like Blenheims and tricolors, and that having black in the coat, as black and tans and tricolors have, is dominant over not having black, like rubies and Blenheims. If you know those basic concepts, then it's really not that hard to figure out that Blenheims, because they have white and because they have no black, have all recessive genes. Now think back to your 10th grade biology class or whenever you took biology. Um, you, you did that little Mendelian genetics thing. And you should know that if a, any living thing possesses two recessive genes, that means there are no other genes hiding behind them. Whereas if they have a dominant gene trait, there could be a recessive gene hiding behind. So uh, with a Blenheim, they have all recessive genes, and because of that, you know that there are no other genes hiding behind them. So all they can produce is Blenheims.
And let, let's look at that chart again. You can see the bottom four rows and the right-hand four columns all deal with breeding black and tans to black and tans. And you see there's every possible outcome there because it depends on what recessive genes are hiding behind the dominance. But if I breed my boy Jamba to a Blenheim girl, we know it's going to be all Blenheims. So obviously the Blenheim population reproduces itself like crazy, whereas the other colors don't necessarily. And of course then breeders get more selective when they're looking for the, the dogs that they're going to breed or the stud dogs they're going to breed to. And the best dogs are going to be found in the largest segment of the population. And so the Blenheims get used a lot for breeding. And the effect is just sort of multiplied that way. But I love all the colors. Apple, I love tricolors. Thank you, Daddy. So do I. Bootsy, I know you're there. They can't see you, but you're there. I love black and tans. Thank you. Sissy asks, what do I do about a puppy who's always chewing? Well, chewing is perfectly natural in puppies. They go through a teething process when they're losing their baby teeth and the adult teeth are coming in where they chew almost everything in sight. They'll chew your finger if you put it near them. Of course, Apple is not a puppy anymore, so she just licks it. But if she were like, you know, 12, 13 weeks old, oh, she'd be gnawing away at my finger. Sometimes they'll get a hold of something you don't want them to chew. Let's suppose Apple was chewing, as a puppy, was chewing on my eyeglass case. Uh, she doesn't want to chew on it. But anyway, if she were chewing on it, I don't want to fight her about it. And I don't want to make her miss it. What I want to do is substitute something that she likes even better. So I take one of her favorite chew toys and I hold that out in front of her. And then she'll grab onto that and she'll forget all about, whoops, <laughs> she will forget all about the eyeglass. Well, if I don't wave it in front of her face, she'll forget all about the eyeglass case. That's the best way I know to combat chewing. But understand, it is going to occur when puppies are teething. Reginald wants to know, how does one become a responsible breeder? In order to become a responsible breeder, you really need to have a mentor who is already himself or herself a uh, responsible, experienced, knowledgeable breeder, one that you respect. In order to make that connection, you have to really become involved in the whole dog world, including dog clubs and shows. Uh, the, the club that's been around in the United States the longest is the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel Club USA. It has its own registry and its own championship point system and its own series of dog shows that are completely independent from the American Kennel Club. Um, and uh, you'll find some of the finest and most responsible breeders involved in that club. Um, you can see their website here. Uh, it's ckcsc.org. You can uh, see a listing of the events. You can become a member. If you have a Cavalier who is registrable, you can become a regular member. But you can also become an associate member, even if you don't. You should attend shows. You should talk to breeders at the shows. And you'll find plenty of them. Shows are held all over the country, about once a month. And you can find the listing on the website. Once you get to know some of the breeders and they get to know and trust you, uh, the next step would be to uh, purchase a puppy from one of those breeders. And possibly one that you could show. And if you get involved in showing and attending the dog shows, they will get to know you. And when you find somebody whose dogs you really like, you could approach them and ask if you could possibly learn from them, have them become your mentor. Maybe be present when they're whelping a litter. Eventually, you could 
purchase a puppy on a co-owned basis where the breeder retains ownership, but in conjunction with you. And maybe that way, breed your first litter. That's how we got involved. We had several Cavaliers who were just pets. Then we started um, we started going uh, to obedience competitions. Then we started showing our dogs in confirmation. You really like this toy, don't you? Um, and we uh, we we got to know one of the established, trustworthy, responsible breeders in the Cavalier Club uh, quite well. We co-owned a girl who had a litter, and then. Once that breeder knew that we were going to act responsibly, uh, we kept one of the puppies from that litter as our own, and that's how we got started. You could also make a connection with the American Cavalier King Charles Spaniel Club. Here's what their website looks like. They are affiliated with the American Kennel Club. Uh, the only thing that I find as a disadvantage is that if you go to a dog show, Whoops. If you go to a dog show that is a, an AKC dog show, and there's tons of those are all over the country constantly every weekend. Um, but if, if you do go, uh, they allow professional handlers. And so when you see somebody in the ring with a dog that you like, you don't know if that's the breeder or if that's a professional handler or somebody else handling the dog. Um, but you can make a connection. There are plenty of breed clubs that are associated with the AKC. I belong to one of them myself. And my last question for today comes from Sally, who wants to know, is it better to have two Cavaliers or just one? Well, actually, Cavaliers are companion dogs, so they love to be in the company of human beings, and they do tend to bond with humans quite well. But they also like to bond with each other, like any animal and any dog, of course. If you do decide to get a second Cavalier, I strongly recommend that you wait at least a year after the first, and I think somebody, and we're unbonded, aren't we? Um, you should wait at least a year before you bring the second Cavalier into your home, because you want that first one to bond with you primarily as their pack leader, so to speak. Um, they do provide each other some company while you're out of the house, so it's not a bad idea. Although we don't generally let our dogs run loose unless they're much older and quite trustworthy, uh, at least two and a half years old, I would say, before they have uh, free reign of the house while we're not home and only for short periods of time. But Cavaliers can go hours without being in human company, and they will greet you like you've been gone for a year uh, when you do come back. So I hope that answers all your questions. Bootsy, come up here. You didn't have a chance to be on my lap for this video. Come on up. Would you like to chew this toy? Nah, that's all right. No? You don't want to chew the toy? I thought I made myself clear. Oh, well, anyway, um, Bootsy and Apple and I uh, are very happy to, uh, there she goes, she loves to sit this way, uh, are very happy to provide you with as much information as we can. So keep watching. There will be more Ask the Breeder videos. What do you think, Bootsy? I think it was a fascinating video. Thank you. I agree.